Welcome to the All Out Leadership Podcast, hosted by Pastor Eric Lawson, where each episode is uniquely designed to help you live all out by bringing you practical leadership from a biblical perspective delivered in 10 minutes or less. So whether you're a business leader, serving in ministry, or simply looking to grow in your leadership, this podcast is for you. Before we dive into this week's topic, make sure to subscribe to the podcast and download the show notes at ericlawson.com forward slash podcast. And while you're at it, feel free to share the content on social media. Now, let's join Pastor Eric for this week's conversation. Welcome to another All Out Leadership Podcast. We are looking at the story of David and Ziklag. Ziklag means winding road. David came up with some bad decisions to save himself. Been there, done that. And it backfired on him. But we see that David did a couple important things right. He encouraged himself, he sought God, and he took some action steps, and he recovered all. Now, we're going to look at the process of pursuit. We're going to see as David's pursuing, we learn some practical leadership principles that we're all going to encounter as we're leading ourselves or we're leading others. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 9, So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor where those stayed who were left behind, David pursued he and 400 men. For 200 stayed behind who were weary that they could not cross the brook. Now, there was about a third of David's men that were so tired, so exhausted from all the other battles they were already a part of that they weren't able to go forward in the journey. What I like about David is what we don't see is him bashing those that couldn't keep up, bashing those that were uh, not able to run the same pace and the same distance as him. As leaders, if we aren't careful, sometimes we will make people around us feel that they're less than us because they don't work the same schedule. They don't work as many hours. They can't necessarily keep up with our pace. Chances are, if you're the CEO of your organization, if you're on that executive team, By nature, you have a higher capacity to run at a faster pace than most of the rest of the team. And what I love about David is he didn't diminish the value of people who couldn't run as long, as fast, and as far as him. David valued and respected people that needed to take a rest. We see that rest is a biblical principle. What we see is God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and he rested on the seventh. God didn't need a rest. God's never been tired. God's inexhaustible, but he modeled the principle of rest for us. And as long as uh, we're on this side of heaven, we'll always need to apply the principles of rest. So number one, as a leader, make sure you're taking your appropriate rest. But number two, give permission to your team to be able to take rest. Make sure that they are taking their breaks, taking their time off, and and don't let it be in such a way that there's kind of like this little cloud of guilt when they're filling out their vacation request form that, you know, they're a less of a person because they didn't have 15 unused vacation days for the year. Uh, In fact, in our culture, I prefer to penalize them for not using their vacation days. You know, what we should be going is, hey, are you taking your vacation? Are you taking your time off? It's part of your job as a leader and a boss to protect the people from themselves. Uh, I'm not a threatening leader. I don't lead by fear and and intimidation. I'm not a, you know, power tie kind of guy. I I try to hopefully lead more out of influence uh, than fear. So I've made very few threats ever to a staff member, but I did make one. And I'm going to tell you this one. I had a a, a young staff member early in our church history, and we had so much to do. There's always something to do when you're starting a church. There's a fire to put out and a bunch of fires you need to start. And, And this person was a really, really hard worker. In fact, to their own detriment. They were just workaholics. And I I would get these emails on their day off from them about all these different work things. Uh, And the other thing was this. It happened to be my day off. I was getting emails about work. That was their day off, which they shouldn't have been sending emails because they should have been off, but they weren't. So finally, I go, hey, uh, why am I getting all these emails from you that are work-related on my day off and your day off? Oh, there's just so much to do, and I got to get it all done, Pastor. And I go, look, Look, you need to take a day off. You you are better with a day off than working seven days a week. You're going to hit the law of diminishing returns. You you just can't run at this pace consistently. It's not sustainable. So take some time off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next Monday, I get more emails. Next Monday, more emails. And I just kept having the same conversation. Finally, I looked at the staff member and said, look, I want you to know something. I love you so much. I'm about to fire you. What? 
And then the eyes got real big. Yeah, I love you so much. You're so good at what you do. I'm about to fire you. What do you mean, Pastor? Why would you fire me if I'm good? I go, because you don't take your day off. You're neglecting your family and you're neglecting yourself. And I know you're neglecting your walk with God because you can't be working this long and have a strong walk with God. I go, look, I owe it to you as your pastor to fire you if you're going to hurt yourself, hurt your family, hurt your marriage, and hurt your kids. Oh, wow, pastor. So here's the thing. Stop working on your day off. Take your day off. There's enough other days to get it all done. And if it didn't get all done, then there's next week. Okay, pastor. And you know what? I got many more years out out of that person and uh, great results. And they came back later and said, hey, thank you for loving me enough to have that conversation and protect me from my self. Next, we see 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 22. Then David, they had captured uh, their families back. They wiped out that raiding Amalekite clan. And so they not only got everything back, but they got the spoils and they got more back. So they're coming back to the men who were by uh, the river that were too tired to go with them. And so we read in verse 22, Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David answered and said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. Number two, David dealt with discord in his team. I find it interesting that the Bible called these men wicked and worthless. And I go, whoa, whoa, hang on. What do you mean wicked and worthless? These were the guys that actually went with David to battle. These were the guys that went the extra mile, killed the Amalekites, got all the stuff back. These were the guys that produced results. And the Bible called them wicked and worthless. In our culture, in our work world, these are the people we value. These are the people that we applaud. But the Bible called them wicked and worthless. Why? Because they were arrogant and they had a spirit of discord among those who couldn't keep up with the same pace as them. And so David dealt with this attitude of discord, the us and them, the silo mentality. You know, we're we're the salespeople. We're the ones that produce the top line results. And, you know, you're not as important because you're a receptionist. You're not as important because you're back in the warehouse. You're not as important because you're just a driver. And what I love that David brings into this team is everybody matters, no no matter what their position and no matter what the results that they're producing. And David deals with that us versus them mentality. And I have hurt myself more times than I can count when I keep staff who are good at producing results, but bring the battles back to the staff. I'm going to say that again. I have hurt myself more times than I can count because I kept somebody on my team who were good at results. Oh, man, they could produce. They could help us get our stuff back. But they were the ones that kept bringing the battle back to the team. They were the ones that kept sowing discord because they were us and them. And, you know, and there's this little spirit of of, of discord and, and, man, just deal with it. And so what I like about David is he didn't just go in there and fire everybody. He just went in there and had an honest heart-to-heart conversation. He went in there and said, hey, guys, this is not our culture. This is not how we do things. He had the tough conversations. Now, ultimately, David wasn't afraid to have transition on his team as well, but he had those difficult conversations and dealt with discord. And so we see that David made a third uh, very important leadership decision, and that is in verse 23 and 25. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For he who will uh, heed you in this matter. But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supply. They shall share alike. And so it was from that day forward, he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel to this day. What I loved that David did here was such a brilliant leadership principle. And he said, hey, look, those that are out in the battle, are just as important as the team that's behind supporting those in the battle. In fact, we see that inside of military, that typically it's about 20% of the military that might be in the combat zones, but it takes 80%, eight out of 10 people behind the scenes to support them, the supply chain, hospitals, food, all kinds of support systems. So it's really for every one soldier out there, it's like five behind the scenes making that happen. And 
it's a team. It's, it's we win together or we lose together. And what I like about uh, football and the Super Bowl is if you're on that team, whether you were out on the field playing, you get the Super Bowl ring when you win the Super Bowl. And that's what David is establishing. He's tearing down the silo mentality. He's tearing down uh, that the executives in the ivory tower or that top salesperson, they're the ones who matter. And the support team is less of a people. David really brought it from us to we, uh, to truly uh, more of a team culture. So David also created a policy for this culture. And there are just times that you see certain things that you go, what? That's a policy. But the key is this, David created a policy for people, not people for policies. And so as you're creating policies, just go back to, is this enforcing the culture that we want? Because unfortunately what happens is uh, some people who are empowered to create policies are creating them to, to protect themselves and not to serve people. What David created in this policy was a policy that served people rather than people serving a policy. That's what Jesus did with the Pharisees. He goes, you strain gnats and swallow camels. And he goes, look, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so remember, policies exist for people, not people for policies. So David created a policy that was for a better culture, not a hindrance to a culture. All right. See you next week on the All Out Leadership Podcast as we continue on the life of David. Thank you for joining us on the All Out Leadership Podcast. We hope you gain new biblical insight that challenged you to grow in your leadership. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we would love your help in getting the content out farther. You can help by subscribing to the podcast at ericlawson.com forward slash podcast and telling others about it. Next week, Pastor Eric will be back with another episode. So until then, we hope you have a great week being an all-out leader.